Welcome to this time of Sunday meditations coming to you from St Andrew's Uniting Church here in the beautiful Sunbury on this second Sunday of this year's season of Advent with a focus on making peace. Imagine a world where God takes shoots and buds and uses them for large purposes. Imagine a world where, a, where baby cows and baby bears play together in peace and harmony. Where lions and lambs live together in safety. Imagine God's world where God's holy mountain provides refuge, peace and safety. Welcome to this time of reflection on the one who takes the tiniest shoot and uses it to signal the peace of God. We dream God's dream of a world of, at peace where enemies are reconciled and children play in safety, where the poor and powerless find justice. We remember God's promise of a ruler of peace filled with the spirit of God, of wisdom and understanding of counsel and might, of justice and faithfulness. We need light to guide our feet into the way of peace. And so today we light a second candle to join our hope in our constant need for peace. Here we tell the ancient tale coming to the story circle of light. This second flame is to bring balance and the promise of harmony. This is the candle of peace. O oh God, we place this light in this holy space as a reminder that we are on this journey together. Be light along all our paths. Lead us to a more just world and help us to stay awake and present to your love in each ordinary day. Amen. The Gospel reading for the second Sunday of Advent is from the third chapter of Matthew's Gospel and tells us of John the Baptist and his preaching, his call to repentance. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, 
for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Judea, Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the area of, of Jordan, and they were baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as, as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptise you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Teach us wisdom, O God. Let your word bring us light. John the baptizer called us to repent as the kingdom of heaven, a pseudonym for those who could not use the word God, comes near. Yet we often decide that we would rather not change our lives to see that realm. You might pray with me as we confess our sins to God and to one another. Hear our hearts, God of peace and justice. We hear your call for repentance and we often ignore it. We find it easier not to change than to orient our lives to you. We find it is more convenient to continue our lives than re-examine them. We would rather glorify being busy than take time to explore the wonders of your world and your world through play. Turn our hearts. Open us to the wonder of your peace and cultivate a desire in us to seek it. Let us know the freedom of your grace. Amen. Blessed is God alone who does wondrous things. Through Jesus Christ we are forgiven, redeemed and loved. Amen. As we might expect in this season of Advent, this week's readings continue the theme of preparing for the arrival of Jesus, for the coming of the kingdom of heaven, of God. Last week, Sue shared <coughs> excuse me, with us some of the ways she prepares for events that she's looking forward to. And she helped us to see parallels with how we should bring these same dispositions to our life of faith. John the Baptist obviously agrees with her. 
He uses the language of road building to make clear that this preparation work includes internal cleansing and not just superficial straightening up around the house. John has gone out of the city into a wilderness place to preach. Wildernesses are by definition dangerous places, filled with wild animals, bandits, wild spirits even. Places respectable people avoid, except for respectable purposes, like travelling or business or visiting family. But wildernesses also have a long tradition of being places of spiritual cleansing, testing and renewal. John recounts numerous such times throughout their faith history, citing the Exodus story and the prophets of Isaiah and Malachi. He expects his listeners would know these ancient stories from the unfolding drama of God's redemptive work. Now, John was effectively, therefore, locating his own ministry and that of Jesus into that larger biblical narrative of God's perpetual work of putting right what we have messed up. Jesus was God's new intervention on this, in this ongoing redemptive work. Being set in the wilderness, away from the city, is significant. Now, be it in ancient times or, or today, cities uh, have been where human imagination of how the world is ordered, what humans can create, and who is destined to rule, have been forged. But instead of calling the people into the city, John instead calls them out, out from the city into the wilderness place, where their nation was formed where God's provision and care had been demonstrated again and again down through history. It is still the case that when we disconnect ourselves from the city and spend some time in a wilderness space, away from the trappings of human traditions and powers, that we are enabled to see and hear God's call most clearly. John was calling people to remember who they were before their kings started building cities and temples, even before they had kings at all. What a coincidence that we from St Andrews are going out of the city this afternoon into Lerdadug National Park. Maybe that will be a time of renewal for us as a people of God of reconnecting with who we were called to be, dating back before I was ever part of this church, before any of you were part of this church. Perhaps spending time outside the city, away from our temple at St Andrews, we might ponder who we really are called to be in that continuing unfolding drama of what God is about in our world. What God is calling us to be part of creating. It's an exciting story. It's both an ancient story, but at the same time a very contemporary story. Indeed, it's an enduringly compelling story of hope and promise. A story that gets us imagining what that world of peace and renewal and justice might look like and how we might contribute to it becoming more real. 
Perhaps inciting the 8th century prophet Isaiah, John had in mind the radically transformed social order that Isaiah evocatively imagined when he dreamt of wolves laying down with lambs, leopards with kids, and so on and so on. These kinds of images remind, uh, sorry, they require an erstwhile predator or a dominant species to forego what they are capable of doing, what they could do, to instead welcome the vulnerable into an embrace of love and protection and compassion, companionship. Isaiah was offering a sense of hope for a time of peace and new potential in relationships between former enemies. We might wonder if Russia and Ukraine might ever find such contentment. But surely we must pray to that end. We might wonder if the American Republicans and Democrats could ever find such mutual respect and trust. But surely we must hope and pray to that end. We might wonder if Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians might ever find such complementarity. But surely we must strive for this in the proposed Indigenous voice to Parliament. We might wonder if there is hope for a fractured friendship or family relationship. But we must commit ourselves to reconciliation and renewal. As John the Baptist calls for, all he calls for is repentance. It's the gospel writers who write in the confessing their sins bit. What John was seeking was a change in people's attitudes and actions. And more than that, he was seeking the kind of change in societal attitudes and actions akin to the vision Isaiah was offering. That is why he was so harsh when he saw among the crowd the leaders of the way things currently were. He didn't hold back. He reacted angrily and insulted them, calling them a brood of vipers. One of my resources points out that this phrase would also be understood as, offering, as you offspring of vipers. Given how much of a person's social standing is derived from one's ancestry, this is a huge insult. And if you don't get this association, just think of some of the responses to the endeavours to redress the great injustices the indigenous peoples of this land continue to experience, consequent of the dispossession they experienced when our ancestors first came to this land. Perhaps the leaders of John the Baptist's time could protest that they were good people, but they were the inheritors of their privilege, and John called on them to repent to be partners in the changes needed to transform their society from the way things were to the way God desires them to be. Now let's remember, recalling another story from our biblical history, the story of Jonah and the Ninevites, that even vipers can heed warnings and repent. John talks of taking the axe to the roots of the tree. Not just to the trunk, but to the roots. For John, re repentance was about rerooting. 
And consequently, baptism in the Christian community very early became not just a rite of repentance, but more crucially, a rite of rerouting a person's identity away from one's birth family into the community of followers of Christ's way. That's what Jesus' baptism was about. And the sacrament of baptism remains a rite of rooting the person's identity in the Jesus narrative, in the family of God, as its primary place of identity. John finishes his preaching with the metaphor of separating the wheat and the chaff. You have likely heard of Fred McFeely Rogers, better known as Mr. Rogers, of the widely lauded American preschool television series, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He was a TV host, he was a producer, he was also a Presbyterian minister. And the film, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, which you may have seen around recently, was based on his life. Mr. Rogers is known for often pointing out that even people who are bad most of the time will be good some of the time. And those who are good most of the time will be bad some of the time. We can all locate ourselves somewhere along that spectrum. What this saying does is caution us against interpreting such metaphors, the separation of the wheat from the chaff, the wheat from the weeds, the sheep from the goats and so on, as being about separating people into groups of bad persons and good persons. They are always about separating the good that is within each person from the bad that is within each person. And John was exhorting us to look inside ourselves, to affirm that which is good and repent of that which is bad to affirm that which is contributing positively to the kind of vision Isaiah paints of a redeemed world and cull out what is preventing us making that contribution. To affirm practices of inclusion and welcoming justice and wholeness and cast off ways in which we are invested in or comfortable with the unjust current order that perpetuates privilege and disadvantage. To be free to make our best contributions to this wonderful, beautiful vision of justice and peace. The kind of repentance John calls us to is not some religious moment or experience in which we come to God and get a ticket to heaven but rather a perpetual state of readiness to challenge the myths of our society that produce alienation and inequity. To be free to live into the wonderful vision of God's new heavens and new earth. Let me finish by quoting some remarks offered by President Obama speaking at his his final national Christmas tree lighting. And he said this, as we retell the story of weary travelers, a star, shepherds and the Magi, I hope that we also focus ourselves on the message that this child brought to this earth some 2000 years ago. A message that says, we have to be our brother's keepers, our sister's keepers. That we have to reach out to each other, to forgive each other, 
to let the light of our good shine for all. To care for the sick and the hungry and the downtrodden. And of course, to love one another, even as our enemies. And treat one another the way we would want to be treated ourselves. It's a message that grounds not just my family's Christian faith, but that of Jewish Americans, Muslim Americans, non-believers and Americans of all backgrounds. It's a message of unity and decency and a message of hope that never goes out of style. They're gr great words. May it be so. Amen. On this second Sunday of Advent season, we continue our focus on projects supported by this year's Christmas Bowl Appeal. This week we hear of the work going on to support the many displaced Syrians who have sought refuge in neighbouring Jordan. Good day. Jordan hosts more than 2.5 million Palestinian refugees, in addition to that, 1.4 million Syrian refugees who fled to Jordan back in 2012. These refugees face a lot of challenges, mainly socioeconomic challenges and problems. And recently, they are facing the challenge of securing their daily needs of food because of the high rate of inflation of prices of food worldwide and in Jordan. From here, DSPR Jordan and its partners worldwide trying to cope with these needs and securing their daily needs of food, in addition to special programs such as psychosocial support, livelihood programs, vocational training, uh, health issues, and capacity building of these refugees. Your support means a lot to these refugees. They will not feel that they are alone. Also, at the same time, building their capacities and empowering them to be more resilient to face the, these challenges. Thank you all for your support and God bless you all. With the awareness of those kinds of places of need scattered around our world, and even here in our own nation and in our own community. Let us bring our prayers to God. Let's still ourselves into an attitude of prayer as we pray for these places. Loving God, who enfolds with love those on the outside and who knew in Jesus what it was like to be excluded, who befriended the despised Zacchaeus, the shunned prostitutes and sinners, the untouchable lepers. Draw close to those at the edges of our communities and give them hope through the patience and encouragement of your people. This Advent, we remember those marginalised because of mental health issues, who often suffer in silence because of stigma, who reach out for help that is often not there because of stretched services, who often feel bleak and helpless. Draw close to them with your wholeness and give them hope through the patience and encouragement of your people. This Advent, we remember those marginalised because of poverty, whose children cannot take part in Christmas celebrations because of the expense, who become increasingly indebted in an attempt to meet expectations, who may have to use food banks for a Christmas meal. Draw close to them with your wholeness and give them hope through the patience and encouragement of your people. 
This Advent we remember those marginalised because of where they come from, whose language is unfamiliar to us and whose customs we are strangers to, who live with the fear of racism and violence, who long for separated families to be reunited. Draw close to them with your wholeness and give them hope through the patience and encouragement of your people. God of hope, use us, your people, as messengers to speak out for and work on behalf of those at the edges. Give us patience and encouragement as promised, so we might be faithful in supporting all those excluded and broken. Hear these our prayers offered in the name of our Advent Christ. Amen. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are tenderly cared for by our beloved God. May we be tender with each other as we remove the masks of the world. May we help each other repair and heal, restore and make whole. May we love one another with the tender love of our Lord Jesus Christ in whom we have life. So go, be peacemakers in the world, clothed in the peace of God, creator, redeemer and sustainer. Amen. Thank you for being with us and may that peace be yours this week. Christmas comes for everyone, everyone.